Check, check. Oh, wow. Hello, Chicago, Illinois. Make some noise. I feel a little bit like a talk show host right now. You know, I got my Chicago Humanities mug. I got three drinks, kind of inexplicably. Like, I'm going to be up here all day. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, surprise. Maybe we we are going to be here. This is, an ex we're, this is a director's cut of our program. We're going to be up here at least till, till dawn. seven. Till, till dawn. dawn. Till dawn. You heard it here first. Uh, Jessica, how are you today? I'm okay. Hi, Jose. Nice to see you. It's good to see you, too. Um, so I thought to begin the conversation, maybe you could read from your new book, Night Moves, um, and then we could talk about it. Okay, cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put on my glasses. Give me a second. Okay, great. Entertain the people. All right. Listen. <laughs> Uh, hello, everybody. In case you don't know me, my name is Jose Olivares. Uh, oh, wow. Listen, thank you. That's really nice. Thank you to, like, the five people that clapped. I appreciate it. It's very good for my ego. Uh, this is my first time at the Chicago Humanities Festival, which is also cool. And I should say I feel very much at home because there's a basketball court here. Uh, and I love basketball. So I feel very good right now. I feel very welcome. Thank you to the Chicago. I, I'm assuming that the court is for me. You know what I mean? I'm assuming that they were like, oh, Jose's going to be I here. I built it for you. It's oh, you built writer. it. Oh, okay. It's, it's Excellent. It's in my writer. Thank so you. If you needed a hoop, if you're going to host. Um, hi. Uh, I'm going to read from my book now. Uh, so I'm going to just read like the introduction that kind of sets up what Night Moves is about. Uh, as you may or may not know, it's, it's mostly a book about going out at night in Chicago from... 2004 to 2008, um, and this is the introduction. It's called Introduction. I came back to the Midwest from LA because the penetrability of Southern California light had gotten to me. It was February 1997, I was 21. The days documented in this book begin in spring 2004, a few years into what has since become a two decade run in Chicago. This book is a testimony of sorts to my obsession with the city. In the early aughts, living in a series of extre extremely cheap and decrepit apartments on the edge of an industrial corridor, I was an unwitting participant in a wave of gentrification that has since subsumed the area. All the empty lots mentioned here are now condos. The moused up punk houses were raised for redevelopment and now only exist in collective memory. I was not yet a professional writer, but mapped that dream often. I was hardly ever without my friends. This is as much about their lives in that particular time and space as it is my own. I'm just gonna read like a two-ish, two two-ish. It's a very short book. I could probably read most of it. Um, but this is, um, so a lot of the book takes place on, uh, is sort of narrated from the back of my bike, basically. Um, and this is called There is a Light on My Bike That Never Goes Out. We are off to Edmar, which is decrepit, Polish, and smells like only old grocery stores smell. A little mildew, a little grandma cologne, the musk of coriander. They're open till midnight, mostly sell jarred food. I got a hazelnut ridden candy bar for a dollar. It's very big and thick and like those kinds I used to sell in order to go on class trips back in junior high. In the lot, I noticed for the first time on my new slash old bike that I had one of those friction light generators same as on my roommate Chris's bike, the same kind that, of light that three minutes before I was calling magic. And voila, it turned out I had one too. I flicked the friction maker on the back into its lock spot, and with a mouthful of chocolate and a quick start, I illuminated my path into the wet Chicago night. I'm shining, I yelled to Chris and reached out to give her a mini brick of the bar. We rode towards home, pulling the tinfoil off the candy and devouring it, powering our tiny lights in tandem. Chris would just hold out her hand and say, more. I was so happy, as happy as I'd ever been. I told the man in the Jeep at the stop sign, we have lights on our bikes, because I wanted him to notice, to not miss the opportunity to witness such safety and inventiveness in motion. I got all the way home, four blocks, and I realized I could not be home. I had to go power the lights somewhere. Every time I saw someone I knew, I stopped, offered them a square of chocolate, and showed off the glow of my new light. See? They would eat the treat and then head in or out of the bar door, congratulating me on my newfound luminescence. 
I ran into Tilo, who was going to the Kill Hannah halfway to Halloween 18 plus dance party at the Nouveau Italian restaurant. She coaxed me in. Over approximately seven minutes, I drank a water, wondered why every girl in the place thought a push-up bra slash corset slash underpants with a pair of Skechers was a costume, heard the killers for the first time, and bummed a cigarette that I only took two drags of off a of daddy goth who rocked both sparkly cowboy hat and Shay Lewis's eyelashes. He called me babe and made that clicking sound like he was goddamn Kelly Savalas. I checked out some asses and got back on my bike. I did not mean to stop at the bar with the big open windows where everyone looks good and seems wasted, but they yelled my name, beckoned me over. They were celebrating new tattoos and 23rd birthdays and dogs they loved and drinking to Berlin with many small bottles of champagne. I gave them my last candy squares. Then, from around the doorway, a boy I spent six years with appeared. He was working the door. You have treats, he asked. Nope, those were my last ones, I said. It was not supposed to be weird, but it was. I think he thought I was just being vindictive for that time he ruined 1997 through 2002. <laughs> I held up the MB wrapper for evidence. <laughs> Sorry. I hopped back on my bike, waved to the faded, and floated home, my little light showing the way. I'm going to read uh, another, another bike. I mean, whatever, the whole thing happens on bike. I don't know why I'm trying to qualify it. Literally, yeah. it's like, and there's like four scenes that happen on a skateboard and like three where I'm walking, and it's only because like I crushed my bike or something. Um, so this is about, this is about uh, going down Damon, which like I assume everybody, yeah, duh. Yeah, it's shout like out to Damon Avenue. Avenue. Yeah, shout out. Eternal shout out to Damon. Yeah, Eternal it's a good shout street. shout out to a grid city. After being on tour for like the last, I don't know, infinity weeks and being in all these other cities with their non-grid structures, it's just pitiful, I gotta say. <laughs> um, this is called American City, I Love You Too. Since enacting my Linton Pact to only drive for work-related errands, I'm experiencing Chicago's deep mantic powers on the daily. This is not to say that I did not love this hobbled city, potholed and blue-collared from the moment I arrived six years and three days ago, but just at having to bike and often down the same route down Damon. Might as well be seeing it for the first time. Oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, where were we? Um, I might as well be seeing it for the first time. All the apartments illuminated with the blue glow of the TV, the living room walls gridlocked by mounted collector's plates, scrub clean dudes in light rinsed je jeans drinking beer from a can on a leather couch, now viewed so easily due to the two-story basement to ceiling windows in front of their new construction condos, the patinaed crosses and gilded domes of all the bright Ukrainian churches, a dude in a red convertible Ferrari with vanity plates reading, Ferrari, holding his dick while he cruises. It's just the stuff you miss where you're in, when you're in the car with B96 up too loud. On Saturday, Al and Nora, the chain-smoking young sweetness that he hangs with, and I all biked 14.4 miles to the Psychic Velic Art Show over at Texas Ballroom in Pilsen. On the way, Nora and I chatted in the bike lane about girl stuff. On the way back, Nora lollygagged behind, and I took off ahead seeing just how fast I could go on a friend's fancy track bike. I was reenacting scenes from breaking away on the barren byways of the heart of, in the heart of Cook County at 2 a.m. on a spring Sunday. Taking Damon Avenue from one side of town to another, you get a good span of Chicago, something practical to counter the highlights reel of Lakeshore Drive. Damon is all that is old, burnished, and lopsided. It is profoundly comforting to live in a city that doesn't give a shit and loves you how you are, just be because it is every bit as marred, bereft, and cocky as you are. We came through Pilsen strip malls, past the 24-7 donut diner, over the freeway overpass, where the trucks exit for the mills and factories, through Latinx revitalization and Art Institute students tangling it up on 18th, through nine straight blocks of taquerias and storefront churches, past bondoed cutlasses, springing tinny oompa oompa bondos, then through the five blocks of the tunnel underneath the, tra the train land bridge that is strangely clean because it's so vast and sketchy that no one walks through it, not even to tag it, 
which empties out into broken cement parking lots and sprawling brick warehouses that once served industries that no longer exist, past public housing bungalows isolated from their now demolished twin, the Ida B. Wells homes in Bronzeville, past Little Italy's ass end, through the hospital campus with its wide presidential appellative streets of Roosevelt and Washington and its Spartan gutters, emptying into the direct arterials of downtown, over the bridge that spans I-290, through a near west side neighborhood holding out against gentrification, past the parking lots of the United Center, trashed after the Bulls versus Golden State Warriors game hours earlier, past the long swath of empty lots and boarded up CHA low rises, tiny mountains of debris and weedy knolls on either side of the Green Line elevated tracks. The parts of West Madison Street that have never been rebuilt since being burned in the riots. Then underneath the tracks where the best car chase in the Blues Brothers movie takes place. Past two women singing Mary J. Blige songs together on the corner. Past a gaggle of hipster friends, of friends in funny outfits waving and hugging while exiting a square dance at open end. Past the Drag City office underneath my favorite train bridge, then three more blocks where I hung a right on Ohio and rode no handed, the last two blocks to my little house. Is that, is that enough? Yeah, absolutely. Good. Good. Give it up for Jessica Hopper. Yeah, yeah, so I guess one of the things that I was wondering uh, goes right back to the introduction. You mentioned leaving LA because of the penetrability of light, what, what does that mean? What were you talking about? Um, so when I lived in Los Angeles, I was one of, I don't know, maybe four people in LA that, um, like in the whole of the city who didn't drive mm -hmm. when I lived there. And so I walked and biked everywhere. And, um, and I would, every time I walked to the store, because there, there weren't really trees, there are palm trees, which, to me are not trees, they're like just decoration basically. Yeah. Um, and I would, I would walk to the store and, and just feel like the light beating down on me and I would always think of, um, I forget who, who it is usually in the Looney Tunes cartoon, maybe it's Daffy, I don't know, but like, like um, kind of just like, uh, they start to sweat and they're like dragging their tongue behind them, you know, kind of like getting beaten down it by the sun. And that's always what I felt like when mm. I was there. Mm -hmm. I felt um, something very primal, like there was no shelter. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to be back someplace with trees. I grew up in the Midwest. And so, um, I mean, it was, it was, uh, it, it seems almost like a two too corny of a metaphor, but it was like, I just needed some shade. Like I just needed, <laughs> I just needed a reprieve. Um, mm. But, but I, had, I had been living in LA for several years playing in bands and, um, and uh, there was kind of this fortuitous set of circumstances where now in retrospect, it feels a little bit like the universe was sort of, um, you know, corroborating some unfortunate events to push me back to where I needed to be, which was that, that um, my totally shitty fake ID got taken away, so I couldn't go to shows. And I mean, it said I was like 26 and like 5'8 and was from the valley and had like this lustrous blonde perm. Like uh -huh. I, I, it was like somebody's sister's friend. I don't know where I got this ID, but it was bad. And um, that and, and the all ages venue, that was kind of my, my home away from home and where my band played in some place that was very close to, like, you know, was my community there, uh, closed up. And so there was kind of like n not much happening. And then I, I came and visited Chicago um, with some friends when I was home uh, one Christmas. And, you know, we went to the fireside, we went to the empty bottle and it was like by the end of my first night here, I was like, I'm moving here. I'm moving here, this is my place, but that um, in, in large part because of the fireside and, and places that felt like, um, felt like just home to me. Yeah, I love that. When, when you moved to Chicago, did you already have your crew of people or did you meet them here? My, I knew a couple people because I, I um, 
at the time I moved here, I I had been doing a fanzine for quite some time uh, since I was a teenager. And at the time when I moved here, I guess I was about 21, 22. I guess 21. That's what says introduction. I'll just go with that. <laughs> um, and and I had friends who were in bands that I worked with and just people that I kind of knew through the scene. But, um, you know, kind of how it is when you first move someplace, you have your friends who are your friends because they're just the people that you know. Yeah. And then it takes a while to get your forever friends. And then the people who are my friends in the book are, are basically my forever friends. And, and I met them, um, you know, a few years into uh, being here, and and all of them are still my friends now, uh, though only two of them still live here. Everybody's split. But yeah, when I came here, I was just like, oh, these are just the people that I know through my friend, and so I'll do the things that they do. So for like when I first moved here, it just meant like I spent a lot of time at the Rainbow, and I lived here for a year before I ever went downtown. Wow. Because they just like, hung out at bars and went to band practice, and that was kind of it. And I was like, that works for me, too. <laughs> and then finally came downtown, I was like, what? This is just wild. Yeah. Big city. Yeah. And I live here. Yeah. So. I'm wondering when it was that you started to feel like Chicago was yours, that it, that, you know, not only did you belong to the city, but that it was where you wanted to be, that it felt like home. And then... A follow-up question also for me is like, so I'm very interested in friendship. I'm interested in friendship because um, I think that friendship gets devalued in contrast to romantic relationships, right? We're told that we, I mean, at least I feel like I was always told that I need to be looking for like my forever romantic partner. Uh, and I judge myself very harshly based on whether or not I had a romantic partner at any given moment, mm -hmm. right? So I, I'm interested in friendships and I'm interested in how vital they are, um, you know, in your book and just in general. So I guess my question is like, when, how did you know that your forever friends were your forever friends? Like what about them made them such great friends? Um, yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was actually thinking about this last night because uh, there was, I was listening to this, um, interview with Amani Perry on uh, the Call Your Girlfriend podcast, and she has a new book about Lorraine Hansberry, and she's talking about how James Baldwin and Lorraine Hansberry, where they had like a thinking friendship, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm sort of um, bastardizing the term that she had, and while I certainly don't think like I am, um, my best friend JR and I are like on that level of like intellectual height, I, I think, um, Part of the reason my friend JR here in front row, shout yeah, out JR. Shout out to JR. Um, that, uh, that part of, part of the way that I think I knew that JR was my forever friend was kind of because we had a thinking friendship. Um, I felt like we were always, we were, we were always talking about what we were reading and watching and thinking about. And like, if I had any sort of, idea of something that I wanted to write about or something that I wanted to do or something that was like bothering me or whatever, you know, JR's had to like endure years of like going on like walks while it's kind of like a monologue for me um, mm -hmm. and, and just walking and talking with JR, which is like something we did last night and is like something that is sort of like a through line in the whole book. And also my joke too is like, this is my memoir, but it's also kind of like my biography of my friendship with JR. Mm -hmm. um, but I very much agree with you that like, you know, I feel like uh, in part, you know, I, I, I purposely made it so there's basically no romantic arc in the book, you know. Uh, there's someone named Matt who shows up quite a bit and that Matt is now my husband, but wasn't at the time of this book. But like, I don't even know if, there's, if I mention like that he's even my boyfriend, he's just around, we're just going on walks, we're just hanging out, but we live together at some point. Um, yeah. In part because I felt like the thing that I'm, I don't know, like the thing that I can always find in books is like, here's this torrid love affair that undid me in my 20s and like whatever, and it's like, I can read that book, I can go to the library and find a hundred of that book, and the thing that I'm always, 
much more interested in is about someone's life in a city or their like literally like their life and times or um, as you said friendship you know because I think for me friendship is has really been the thing that's evolved my thinking and my being more more than any um, romance you know that some of my really close female friends have been the people that have like seen me through these things and and uh, in particular some of my uh, you know my close female my close non-female friend here. <laughs> um, yeah. my, my, some of my other best friendships have been, you know, the things that have really changed how I thought about music and really um, made me, inc like, encouraged my curiosity about the city. And to me, that's the way, kind of, I, I guess, when I really felt like Chicago was mine, to back end that question. Yeah. I mean, I kind of felt like that a little bit right when I first got here, but I don't think it was until kind of during the arc of this book where, where I started to feel so deeply curious about the city and its history and the history of its music and its poetics and um, why, just why was Chicago Chicago? Why was Chicago like Chicago? How did it get this way? And, and, and particularly like this kind of excitement of being able to read like, um, Gwendolyn Brooks, and, and, and recognize some of these characters in Bronzeville, or the way that she represented the city, and be like, I felt that way, I've seen that thing in the city. Or, um, you know, uh, Nelson Algren, Neon Wilderness, and, be, and he's talking about like, uh, I think it's Ogden Avenue Eyes, or something mm -hmm. like that, like this, this feeling of walking down this stretch of street, near, right near where I lived in Ukrainian Village at the time, and, and feeling really connected with these narratives um, of the city that were decades old. Yeah. And being like, like the kind of, I loved the kind of indelibility of Chicago in that way of like the character of the city and, and really loving and connecting with it. Mm. I love that. I love that idea of like walking through a city and recognizing touchstones from literature. For me, one of the things that I love to do when I'm in a city is like listen to music from that city while like riding the train. So like I lived in New York for a couple of years and I used to love to ride around Brooklyn listening to Biggie or whoever. Uh, it made it, it was cool to like have the echoes also be present in like what I was seeing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think about that too. I was, I was actually just thinking about that because I was listening to the new Mick Jenkins and yeah. and like all these different tiny references to like little things in Chicago and I just like I really relished being like I get that <laughs> and if I lived in New Jersey I wouldn't get that you know um, all all shade to New Jersey I guess yeah um, yeah but that um, yeah I mean and 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 a lot of the music of Chicago is what what made me so excited to be here when I first came here and you know seeing. <laughs> you know, un untold scores of, you know, Midwestern emo bands at the Fireside Bowl. And, um, but, but also it was like, you know, in, in the book, getting introduced to music that I knew about and I was curious about but couldn't see in LA, which, you know, like the free jazz scene and, uh, you know, to a certain extent, the hip hop scene and things that were um, just kind of not available to me in the same way in LA. Um, yeah. There's this scene in the book that I love where JR is kind of ragging on you because you haven't seen this like genius performer, even though they play at the empty bottle like, you know, 300 nights a year, and you've only seen them like it's three Ken times. Ken Vandermark. <laughs> that he's like ragging on me for not seeing Ken Vandermark at the time when Ken Vandermark was like literally like multiple years into doing like a Monday night free jazz residency, and even that, like I just somehow hadn't seen Ken Vandermark. Um, but yeah. And then, and then we go see Ken Vanderbark. Yeah, and, and it's crying. great, yeah. And, and I'm like crying, at, <laughs> I cry at multiple free jazz shows, spoiler alert. Yeah, I guess, <laughs> when I read that, I was wondering if there are any kind of artists in residence in music that you would want people to check out, you're, where you're like, yo, this person is at the Empty Bottle, or this person is at Shoe Buzz once a month, and you really have to go see them and experience them. I mean, this is, uh, and 
I'm not, I'm not saying this because we're like sitting on stage together, but for me right now, as much as any music is, is like a, a very, you know, um, uh, revivifying connection to the city, I think it's poetry as much or if not more so than mm. music. Like, I mean, the m number one reason that I, I mean, like I come in t uh, last night, I came in saw a show at the Empty Bottle, saw Joan of Arc for like the 89th time in my life and they're still great. Um, but like I come into the city more to see like poetry more often, to see you read, to see Fatima read, to yeah. see, I mean like Eve read, I mean like everybody just like all the rad YCA people, that's one of the things that makes me so excited. It makes me feel that much mm. more connected to the city, um, even more than um, new bands. But like also the other thing too is like, I think one of the things that's great about Chicago is that I think it's still a place that people move to from, you know, like if you live in Louisville or whatever, or Madison, maybe this is like where you come to make your dream come alive. and. Mm -hmm. So because of that, and because I've been here like for 80, 100 years at this point, I've seen all these successive waves of people come here with their big idea and their art and, and make something rad that starts to shift the city and the sound of the city or what's exciting about music here. You know, where I'm seeing like, I don't know, probably the eighth wave of that since I've been here for literally like 20 some odd years. Um, yeah. and, and that's one of the things that I love about it. Yeah. Thank you for that plug, by the way. Right. <laughs> I, I also Unscripted. Just have to say, like, I want to. I um, m Jose's book of poetry is my favorite book of the year, so this is really like a rad treat for me. Um, it's called Citizen Illegal. I'm just gonna just shout it out. <laughs> it's extremely good. Thank you. It's extremely good. I've read it many times. I highly recommend it. Thank you. All right. Uh, um, so, uh. One of, one of the other scenes that I love in the book is, so one of the things that I love about it is in the book, you're in kind of the same age range that I'm currently in. And so seeing you talk about certain things like uh, your friends who are brilliant writers, who are working retail, who are working at H&M just waiting for their opportunity. Like I think about that a lot. And there's this beautiful passage where like, you're you're like with Jr. again, and you're like having, a, you know, you're you're like thinking through everything, and Jr. is like explaining that uh, in order to send things to Mars, uh, NASA has to like slingshot it around the moon, and then he says to you, like you're just slingshotting around the moon right now, and I guess I'm wondering like, I I don't know that those chapters about that being on the brink of something and yet having it seem like both so close and so far, like that's also around the time, I think, when you do your first piece for the reader and now, you know what I mean? Like, I guess I'm wondering if you can talk about what that felt like in those moments and, you know, what it feels like now looking back at it. Uh, I was really, uh, I was really grateful for being able to kind of go back and revisit these you know, entries, these things that were contemporaneous writing from 2004, 2008, because I think, uh, you know, a, adult me, suburban mom me, 42-year-old me, uh, would mostly look back at that time and just be like, oh yeah, I was so broke. My apartment was so gross. Mm -hmm. My, you know, like whatever, and kind of remember the parts of it that feel retrospectively kind of pitiful. Um, but being able to read this and revisit these things um, that, that sort of confronted me with like kind of a different document um, that wasn't necessarily, um, you know, romanticized that time per se, but that it kind of right-sized my, my vision, my reality, my what was really happening at that, at that place and time, um, and and that, that's the str the struggle of it, yeah. but that I wasn't um, exhausted by it. But I did have that sense, I think, at that time of, of waiting, of um, 
trying to like uh, grab onto something. Like because at that time I was I was really mostly supporting myself um, by writing uh, previews, like show previews for the reader, which is uh, which was hardly a living. It was real air quotes living um, and different stuff, just DJing crappy parties, some little 50 buck thing, and maybe every once in a while some like, you know, you'd get, so, you know, there'd be like a store, like a new Adidas store opening, or some random store in Wicker Park was opening, and somebody would have like 150 bucks, or like, yeah. you know, 75 bucks to DJ New Year's at the Empty Bottle, you know? Yeah. You'd be like, yeah, all right, I'm like a third of my way towards making rent. Um, <laughs> I, I really live in like kind of a gross apartment that was very very cheap, thankfully. But you know there was that there was that sense of like oh and at some point we'll sort of like summit this. Mm -hmm. You know like I, I felt like I could kind of see my adulthood somewhere in the distance. Um, but it, but I definitely knew it wasn't it wasn't there yet. Mm -hmm. There was something you said that I wanted to ask about, and now I'm oh about I'm wondering. So you mentioned like coming back to these entries and reading them, and I'm wondering if you were surprised, like, because I think memory continues to change, what about revisit, were you like, wow, that's how it happened? A, a little bit, you know, the first time I went through this group of, this sort of, just of, of the, the entries, I can hear like a radio or something kind of suddenly. It sounds like Me the too. Backstreet Boys or something. I don't know. Now I feel like I'm losing my mind. Like, do you no, guys I hear, hear the back of voice? No, I hear it too. I hear it too. They're following me. Yeah. Um, there was a there's a line and there's a line in the book that says, "If I'm not living my most hopeful politics at the ripe old age of 29, 29, I remember that. Then, like, then what the hell am I doing? And reading that at, at when I was putting this together, it would have been 40 or 41. Um, you know, having just left kind of like a sketchy corporate job that I was doing for a little while, <laughs> and uh, a feeling very distant from my writing, feeling deeply suburban, um, that line kicked my ass. Like, I was going to ask. That kicked my ass, where I was like, Ooh. You know, like, like, um, and thinking about what would twenty-nine-year-old me think, or like, yeah, the it it was like, uh, it made for basically like uh, an immediate sort of inventory of my life, creatively, politically, whateverly. <laughs> you know, that it really made me think about what does that look like as an adult me. What does that look like? What do I want that to look like, you know? Um, because also, me at that point, I was, I think I was living my life in, in kind of like a little bit more actively uh, engaged with like, you know, various sort of dogma or, you know, a different kind of like rigor about what is selling out. I didn't have kids yet. I didn't have mm. anything that was really, uh, informing my decisions uh, in the way that I do now other than like, is this gonna pay my rent? Do I feel like, a, you know, like, you know, is this, is this, uh, what are my most hopeful politics? What do those look like at that time, 2017? And how does that, how do I live them? Yeah. Not just tweet about them. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that was, I mean, that, in a weird way, that was a big gift of the book because it just kicked my ass and kicked me back towards writing, kicked me back towards being engaged in different forms of mentorship and, um, and being engaged in different ways politically within the world. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. You know, hearing you talk about those, like, $75, $50 gigs... <laughs> I rem you know, my very first working experience in Chicago, I was living in an apartment in Logan Square that cost $400 per person. And the way we were able to pay rent was by 
taking these hundred, we'd like read poems for an hour and get paid like <laughs> nothing. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> nobody was listening, and but we'd get like a hundred bucks and we'd be like, all right, here we go. <laughs> we'd be like, listen, cooking steak tonight, <laughs> having a good time. At the, at the, I was, I was explaining to different people, and I, I always kind of relished saying this, particularly when I was on like the West Coast and everyone I know is paying like two grand in rent is like a reasonable amount. Um, and you know, I know that's like what some people pay in different parts of Chicago, but like at the beginning of the book, I'm paying 250 bucks a month for rent. And by the end, I've upgraded my lifestyle at the behest of my now husband, then boyfriend, who was like, you don't own a vacuum cleaner, <laughs> and this house is like disgusting. I'm not living <laughs> in here. And we I had to like move in someplace else, and it was like my rent was almost 500 bucks, and I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna make this kind of <laughs> money from writing, you know? And in my mind, I was like, okay, that means I have to make like at least $500 a month, and another $500 to like live on, because my standards were like pretty <laughs> low of like what kind of um, living I could make as a writer, and I was like, all right, I gotta be ambitious and make like 1,200 bucks a month. You know, it was pretty, pretty, uh, sad state of affairs, but I was really grateful. I mean, all I did was just write all the time. And even then, writing all the time still left me with like an incredible amount of free time. And that's sort of when I fall in love with the city in a lot of ways, because I'm just like riding my bike around going like, what's this, what's this, what's this? Or like walking down you know, the, uh, the train line with JR and JR telling me, you know, JR knows a lot about uh, Chicago and Illinois history that mm -hmm. sort of gets a little bit of it imparted via via me in the book, but um, learning about what all of these things were and what these areas used to be, and um, I wasn't someone that was necessarily previously interested in history, and it, and and all of those things sort of start to congeal at the same time. Cool. Um, so one of the things that I also found interesting was uh, you you spend a lot of time in the book talking shit about yuppies. <laughs> and I was wondering how, how you came to see how like your crew identity formed as a, opposed to or you know, in proximity to yuppies. Because you know, the very first image of the book is like one, a, a gentrified person like falling on themselves and then everybody laughs at them, you know? Mm -hmm. Like it's, and there's like moments of disdain throughout the book. So I'm interested in hearing like, when, when did you see them and like, how did they, how did you come the, to understand? the wild of the Yeah, park. yeah, how did you come to understand their that presence? Um, I mean, I think there's something, um, you know, I'm not to say that it's like, it, it, it's sort of, there's this, I guess a distinction of those, like those people as a gentrifying force, but also I have to recognize very much my friends and I were part of that force. We were kind of um, maybe part of like the, the ground troops that were, you know, a few years ahead, making, you know, a space change in a way where then that neighborhood also felt welcome to like, you know, these dudes that I'm mocking in their pleat front pants and their white hats and yes. like, you know, wasted in their DePaul t-shirt, you know, having migrated up from Lincoln Park or whatever. No shade, I have plenty of friends that went to DePaul. <laughs> um, love love uh, DePaul. Sh shouts to DePaul. Yeah. And their, their what, terrible whatever, basketball yeah, program. Yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> um, all their things. Um, and, and, but that, it, you know, we couldn't not be aware of that because also in the book, as I talk about it, it's like, you know, uh, I, I live at a, for a time in these two houses that are, um, I lived in one punk house and then moved into the punk house that was next door. And, um, you know, after, after we leave this, the second one, they're both raised and literally million dollar condos go in after them. Wow. And after I live in this warehouse, you know, somebody before me had fixed up the warehouse, but then we lived there and we fixed it up some more. And then after we leave, um, you know, this place that has like literally two windows that open, it's 4,400 4, square feet, everything else like boarded up and we're right next to the train and it was like awful, but you could 
you could fit a lot of people in there for a party and you know at 25 like what else do you want your house for basically uh, yeah. other than a place to sleep and throw a party um and then all of a sudden it's like it has windows and like i, I remember feeling indignant like enraged like there are windows they look like windows you can open it's like now this is, looks like the ace hotel like you know <laughs> and and this you know, it was like these warehouses where it's like the people across our hall were like one of those situations. Maybe people are here have lived in them where it's like the warehouse space where it's like 13 people live there and the walls only come like, you know, eight feet up. And you can just yes. hear everything that's like, but it'll be so cheap and everyone's band can practice. But it's like a real bad living situation um, yeah, yeah. W with like a giant chore wheel and a lot of veganism and it's all happening. Yeah, um, I, in, when I lived in <laughs> Logan Square, there was a poetry collective that lived a couple blocks away and they had, they didn't have real walls, they had like dividers yeah. that didn't go all the way to the city. <laughs> but they, I think each of them were paying like $200 a yeah, pop. Yeah, like tops, tops. So you and they would really throw shows. It was like, it was the best spot. It, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I was li I, I, living in this warehouse, it was like definitely like the nine person like collective that lived across from us and then where we lived and but I, I there was no way to not be aware of what you were bringing with you because mm -hmm. every place you lived after you lived there it got turned into somebody's schmancy ass condo right like you like there was no way not to know that we were a harbinger of something and the we being like you know kind of a creative class people in bands uh, students you know like and and then after then then something would change and that change seemed, you know, it seemed sometimes, it, it seemed kind of like an inevitability, mm -hmm. like our presence brought this thing. Mm -hmm. But that, um, who some of these, you know, these gentrifying dudes in their light rinse jeans and, you know, <laughs> like barfing outside underdog at 3 a.m. and, you know, kind of all the things that they bring with them and the, the, the condos, the, the whole glass front condos, um, that, I mean, those things seem to really accelerate kind of at the time in the book. And so where did we encounter them? We encountered them outside our bars in their weird brown leather jackets and, um, yeah. you know, all these things that sort of felt like our spaces, which yeah. were like, that was a misnomer in itself, yeah. you know, um, particularly because it was like Humboldt Park, Ukrainian Village, Wicker Park, West Town. That wasn't like our space. It was just where like me and my friends had happened to move in five, ten years before these these condo these people that could afford condos, these people that could afford mortgages, things that just seemed like you know right. something very distant and, and different from us. People who had like regular ass jobs and regular ass aspirations. And yeah. um, at twenty eight that was something that I like looked askance on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean granted it's very fun. <laughs> to make fun of those people. Um, you know, the, the thing that you said that I really think about is it's not just them, but it's everything that they bring with them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, because in of itself, like their terrible brown leather jackets, whatever, like <laughs> who cares? You know what yeah. I mean? People are free to make all sorts of fashion faux pas, you know? Mm -hmm. That's their choice. But it's everything that they bring with them. It's the fact that I, when I think about gentrification, I think a lot about power, you know, mm -hmm. and about how uh, people expect that just because they live in a neighborhood now that everything should cater to them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that, um, the, that, the, the, that the two ways should turn into uh, a ramen shop or um, that all the bars that play music or the venues that play music where people are outside and it's loud should now be quiet because these these people have arrived and they have sleeping children or like all the things, you yes. know, where it's like, well, the bar was already there. The bar's been there for 48 years, you know, yeah. or these and if you, things. And yeah. if you really cared about your sleeping children, then move somewhere that doesn't have a bar, you know what I mean? So, I mean, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, I remember there was a lot of things that that at that time having these weird sort of like casual encounters with all of a sudden having to take up space with sort of these, um, this, this force of folks. And there's a particular um, reading that's sort of at the end of the book where we um, sort of in, uh, encounter, really it's about two o'clock in the morning, we're outside Picante, which is 
it's still a taco spot right there, kind of Damon and Division yep. with my friends. And, um, and they talk about how we're invisible to these people unless they're really, really drunk. Mm -hmm. And that uh, living, live in, I think I say, living in a city full of drunk jocks will keep you punk forever. Mm -hmm. But that, um, stand by that sentiment. Um, <laughs> it really, I, I, I that's real. Uh, when I when I read that uh, I read that almost every night on tour, and the place that got the biggest laugh is is Nashville, which is a city that is having that has a, a, a wide variety of drunk jocks, um, yeah. apparently. <laughs> but then a uh, uh, and, and a city that's really um, gentrification is is straight up bulldozing various uh, neighborhoods there. Um, but where was where was I going? But um, you know that that it was yeah, it definitely felt like. I mean, it wasn't just like, oh, we're getting priced out. It was um, that the presence of the fuck said there was, there was, um, I mean, I like to think, and who knows if this is actually true or this is mm -hmm. my own, you know, romantic sense of uh, myself or my wish for, you know, how woke I was at 28 or whatever. Um, but that I liked to... I like to imagine that like my friends and I weren't changing necessarily the edifices of of the neighborhoods that we were in, that we weren't um, making things sort of different in a way that was irreconcilable. Like I, I have this very vivid memory of um, the it's now a hotel, I guess, in Wicker Park, and the idea that there's even a hotel in Wicker Park. I'm so old that I'm like, I can't believe there's like multiple hotels. <laughs> Yeah, that there's multiple hotels. Like, I just, I d I'm basically, you know, like a crabby old lady about that stuff. And, um, but I have this very vivid memory of JR and I very briefly had a pirate radio show. There was a pirate radio station in that building, and that we would hold, you ha one person had to, like, be the DJ, and one person had to hold this, like, two by four that was super long and it was too heavy out the window with like the aerial antenna to broadcast. <laughs> I don't know who was listening to this, but it seemed very important that we do this. Um, and it was like really kind of like exciting. And I just remember there was like nothing in that building. And the last time I went to it, it was like, I was literally, you know, whatever, I'm part of the problem. I was in there like having a meeting about like some marketing for a festival that someone wanted me to consult on or something mm -hmm. like in the lobby of what is now a hotel in, in Wicker Park. But just remembering like, um, certain things that I, you know, I don't know, I felt like changed really rapidly once there was a presence of, of these other folks. And I think we just assumed they all came from Lincoln Park. Mm. That is certainly might be a accurate. fair, might be yeah, accurate, fair assumption. Definitely. All right, so... Uh, We've been talking for like three hours. I can't have been... I, I told you, minutes. this is going to be the director's cut. Uh, so this actually, right now, we're going to start taking questions from the audience. So if you have questions for Jessica, please raise your hand. Also, and Jose, we'll take a question, perhaps. Maybe. It depends. I might just throw one to you. All right, great. We have a question right here. Please tell us your name. And please, uh, just as a reminder, keep your question to a question. Do you realize that, that usually artists and alternative culture types, they move into uh, white, or, or, I mean, to working class or minority neighborhoods usually are usually the, 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 the people that lead to gentrification? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very aware of that. Um, I mean, that's that sort of uh, not in, there's some direct references to that in the book. I mean, what, that's sort of what I was saying, like that it was, it was impossible to be unaware of that, um, like the, the sort of what was being transacted on us as, you know, a young white artistic class, what we were, we were playing a transactional role in these neighborhoods. You know, when I moved into Ukrainian Village, it was mostly like geriatric Ukrainian people on my block. I mean, granted it still was, but I got you know, 20 years later, I got priced out of there. Um, but yeah, no, that's, I think that is, I agree with that statement. We have another question over here. Hi, name is Jacob. Uh, so I've been lucky enough to be part of like kind of a similar venue as you're talking about. Like there's like this three, four underground building in, in uh, West Lakeview that we have a theater and then the top floor is a venue and you're constantly competing with the other. Oh, right. 
Yeah, but I was just curious, like, uh, what was, like, maybe one of your favorite places, like, around those kind of, like, a hole in the wall that's maybe there or not there that you still, or, like, if it is still there, you still go to? You know, I think... I remember going, like, I mean, Fireside is always the one that I kind of shout at. I remember going to some, like, real, like, Buddy in Heaven were these, um, were these uh, warehouse spaces that were upstairs, downstairs from each other, above where the big furniture store is, up uh, in Wicker Park. Like, if you go, like, basically, if you're... What would like what would the address have been? On Milwaukee? Yeah, Milwaukee. Like the fifteen hundred block of Milwaukee. I'm just like in a JR, like a GPS. <laughs> um, I, for a period of time around like kind of around the start of this book, so like oh four, oh five, going to some like really wild, weird shows, parties, DJ sets there couple times being like really convinced the floor was going to collapse and that we were going to fall from one venue into the other. Um, and, and I was briefly on a roller skating team that is mentioned here. Um, I love that. We were like a, a roller skating collective. Um, yes. <laughs> and we would have roller skating practice. I, I mean, like we performed at a show once. I don't know what, what, what sort of business it was, but it was like, way to hang out and get like some exercise and like whatever <laughs> in the yeah. winter. And that we just had these, at one point we got matching outfits. I don't know what this was about, but that I have very vivid memories of skating around Buddy at high speed and like running into, <laughs> we were all terrible, like running into each other and the walls at Buddy. Um, but then also going to shows there later on. I have stories about being a roller, roller skater. I'll tell you later. Uh, <laughs> for me, uh, one of the spots, there was a spot called The Elastic, also uh, on Milwaukee Avenue. And every weekend, there would be these hip-hop shows that nobody went to except me and Nate Marshall <laughs> and whoever was performing. And there were always like 10 people on the bill. Uh, and it was my favorite thing ever. I loved all those rap shows. All those rappers were like my heroes. I loved all of them very deeply. I remember seeing the flyers for those. I don't know if yeah. I, ever, I think I went, maybe there was like every once in a while they might have a jazz show. Oh, maybe. I don't know. I only went for hip hop usually. Uh, anyways, but yeah, there was, I mean, there was definitely a lot of those venues now that are, and even short lived like house show venues. Yeah. We have another question here. Hi, uh, my name is Tanner, and I am currently a very broke writer trying to figure things out. And Welcome to the club. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that I think I just want to hear more from you about, because I also bike around quite a bit, and it's just the magic of biking, to me, anyways, it, it keeps me so satisfied even when there is nothing else to do. So I just kind of want to hear a little bit more from you. Like, what about it, biking in the city? For me, it's just, it's so flat. It's the grid. Like, what about here was so magical to you on your bike? I mean, part of it was, it's flat. Um, living in LA, it's like real, so much getting off and having to walk your bike. It was fairly miserable. Um, I mean, I think one of the, one of the, I think there's kind of no, other than walking, I think there's no better way to explore Chicago than bike because you can get off everywhere. You can, or you can be like biking around and kind of as I wrote about, like you can hear and smell things. And I remember. You run into a marching band once in the book. Yeah, <laughs> like, like all, and, 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 and a parade and like all kinds of stuff that you're just like, whoa, what's this? Shit, I'm gonna get off my bike and like hang out for an hour, or do whatever. I was someone without much of a schedule other than like trying to desperately return my library books on time so I couldn't rack up fines. I couldn't even afford the fines. Um, <laughs> but that, uh, you know, I have one of my strongest sense memories of biking in Chicago is riding down Division really late, super muggy, like probably June, July, August, somewhere in there, like peak muggy summer, riding down to it's the It's my lake. season. I love and, that time of year. And, and being down by some of those like kind of real like downtown party bars right when you get to the end of Division before you, I, I don't even know what their names River are. River North or Gold Coast area. But like, yeah, kind of like Gold Coast, but like, like, I don't know. And I just remember being on my bike by myself, all of a sudden catching like the, this really cool breeze off the lake and then also getting like um, 
somebody had opened the door to the bar. It was like after bar closed. I think it was like, I mean, I was right around at like dawn and or just really late. It was still dark out. And someone opened the door to the bar and they're cleaning it out with that kind of like really industrial, almost like pine saw, super, super pine saw, bar pine saw. Do you know? I mean, we all yeah. know the smell, right? Yeah. And kind of like, kind of vomit, kind of trash, kind of piss, like all this stuff. And then the lake. A and little more. the lake. And it was like all these things together, and it was like just like the most Chicago sense. It was like peak Chicago sensorial experience on my bike, and because I was on my bike, I could ride away from it, thankfully. <laughs> but like that, that smell and that feeling is like permanently, you know, like kind of I can immediately go to it mm -hmm. in my in my brain and in feeling of my body. Whereas if I had just been driving past, I would have just rolled up the window. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so um, I think I think that's a great way to investigate and to come to love and or hate the city is on bike. That is unfortunately all the time we have for questions today. As a reminder, we do invite you to join us in the back of the room for a book signing after this program. And thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you, you so much for joining thank us. You. Thank you. It was great talking to you. Thanks.